Hi everyone, it's Mr. B, and um, I am recording this short lecture on how to read a Shakespeare play because you're going to be reading a Shakespeare play. <laughs> and uh, I want to try and, as best I can, eliminate some of the stress. Um, so that's the goal. I want to, it's because a lot of people are nervous about Shakespeare, uh, worried about not understanding, language is really old, it's 400 years old. Um, so let me just reassure you um, by saying it's okay not to understand. The vast majority of people, including professors, do not understand every word of Shakespeare. Language has gone on and you can get better. That's the other thing. You add The more you do it, the easier it will get. You'll remember words that recur. So. My goal here is just to try and take off some of the stress, so I hope that I'll succeed. So, first piece of advice, don't try and read too much at, at a time. Take it in small doses, okay? Read for 20 minutes, do your best to understand, get up, uh, walk around the room, have a glass of water, and then maybe take some more. Um, so, if you stop here and get your book, um, and you look at the text that we're going to read, um, you'll notice the glosses at the bottom of the page. So there are these small uh, little circles next to the word um, that the editors of our book think that you might not know. And so what that means is you're supposed to look down at the bottom of the page and look for the line number and they give you the modern English translation okay you can't look down at every one right um, you have to do it like I say in moderation uh, because it'll take you so long to read the play and it will really break up your rhythm so um, here's one thing to think about there's a lot more punctuation in Shakespeare, uh, take this word for example, twas, twas the night before Christmas. Well, that means it was, right? So the apostrophe is kind of in the wrong place, but we all know that twas means it was, and there are a lot of these kinds of things. Or, it was an or hasty marriage. What goes where the apostrophe is, is a V, over, over hasty marriage. And you'll get used to identifying these things. Toldest. Uh, toldest. Thou toldest me so yesterday. We don't use that past tense of told anymore. Um, but there, there would have been an E there. Toldest. Uh, told. You just say told. <laughs> um, there are a lot of words that we no longer use or forms of words, you know, like in the sign thou, thee, thy, thine, and thy. Essentially, we know that they mean you, right? You might have read a King James version of the Bible that has these words, and we get that they mean you, even though we don't say that anymore. Uh, mine, mine eyes have seen the glory. It just means my, used to mean my. Dust, dost thou know me? Well, we can kind of guess that this means do, and thou means you, do you know me? So you can kind of pick out meaning. Wilt thou help thy fellow man? It means will. It, it looks close to will, and that's what it is, will. Wast, thou wast unworthy of her. Uh, an old way of saying were. So thou wast means you were. You were unworthy of her. Wherefore. This one's a little bit tricky. A lot of people think that wherefore where. Um, look at the quote. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth. It actually means why. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? It actually means why are you Romeo? Because since you're a Montague, his name was Romeo Montague, that meant Juliet Capulet could not be with him because their families were at war. She's actually saying, Romeo, Romeo, why are you a Um, sometimes the definitions of words have shifted. Um, 
we say what's the matter to mean what's wrong in Shakespeare's day what is the matter it means more like a scientist would use the word today like what is the substance um, player all the world's a stage and the men and women in it merely players we use the word player now like player um, to mean well we all know what it means it's like a guy that uh, that is uh, flirtatious and kind of manipulative and has multiple girlfriends right um, in Shakespeare's day, it just meant an actor. A player was an actor. They play in plays, right? Uh, faculties, not as we would use it, uh, you know, the people who teach at a university. Uh, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty. In their day, Shakespeare's day, it meant more like we described the faculty of sight faculty of reason, um, like a kind of a biological skill, I suppose. Uh, syntax. Syntax just means sentence structure, the way words are ordered in a sentence. Uh, what said he? Well, we can kind of piece it together. It's not the way we would say it, but it really were meaning, what did he say? Uh, how came you by this handkerchief? We would say, how did you come by this handkerchief. Or, yeah. um, let me but kiss thy hand. Mm, I just want to kiss your hand, is essentially what that is saying. Uh, so these like syntactical dis constructions that we don't really use very much, um, you know, it's like kind of Yoda speak from Star Wars, right? What said he? That's something like he would say. I will, in Cassio's lodging, lose this napkin. So we would say, now, in Cassio's lodging, I will lose this napkin, and lose meaning uh, place. Uh, man delights not me. Man does not delight me, is how we would say it. Oh, my good lord, yonder's foul murder done. We would say, over there, there's been a foul murder. <laughs> Didn't really say yonder that much anymore. You know, most people kind of know what it means over there. Um, would you would bear your fortune like a man? This is an odd one. It really means if only you would bear your fortune like a man. Essentially, it's saying be a man if you could just be a man. Um, you know, like it looks tricky, and I understand there's a lot of stress around this stuff, but it does get better. Like I said, the more you do it the more you understand these older syntactical constructions. Right. Um, moving on. Think about the context. Um, here's Iago in Othello. Nine or ten times I had thought to have yerked him here under the ribs. Well, you'll have known Iago a little bit by the time you read this, and not that many things you can do to someone under the ribs that might be described as yerk. It's not a word we use anymore, but if you guessed that it meant stabbed, then you're right. <laughs> um, and you got that just from the context. We don't use the word yerk anymore. Um, how about this one? I let me the canakin clink, clink, and let me the canakin clink. A soldier's a man, a life's but a span. Why then let a soldier drink? Some wine, boys. Well, what are you clinking when you're drinking? <laughs> you're drinking some kind of cup or container or a can. So that we just got totally from context, right? So that, you'll be able to do that as well as you read. Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Think about that. Hamlet, okay, we know thou is you. Hast, probably have, right? Hamlet, you have cleft. Think about that word. You might have seen it before. We use the word cleft chin. Um, my wife has one of these. It's the little split that some people have in their chin. Um, she prefers the term chin, uh, a dimple in her chin. It's cleft. It's, it's split, right? Um, so, Hamlet, you have split my heart. Got that. In twain. You might not know what twain means, but you can guess from the context 
What do you split something in? You split it into Hamlet. You have split my heart in two. You have cut my heart in two. Right? So it's a kind of like investigation of words reading Shakespeare. And just be forgiving of yourself. You are not going to understand everything, and that's okay. That's okay. Let's look at this one. Macbeth has just discovered that his wife has been killed, and he utters this monologue. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. So far, so good. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying. Well, you can tell from the context, he's unhappy. <laughs> uh, understandably so. And um, so what is he saying? Tomorrow and tomorrow, these days kind of creep in their petty pace from day to day to the end of time. Uh, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Seems to be bemoaning this kind of grim existence that we live from day to day, out, out, brief candle. He's talking about how short life is. So the candle is kind of a metaphor for life. Um, and his wife's life, her candle, has just been snuffed out. And here he comments on what life is. Uh, another metaphor. Life is but a walking shadow. Life's only. That's what the but Life's only a walking shadow. Uh, it's kind of a mirage. A poor player. We know now that a player is an actor. A bad actor. That struts and frets his hour upon the stage. It's, you know, kind of shows up, goes on the stage for his part. It's only an hour. It's short, like the brief candle. And then is heard no more. And he's off. The curtain falls. It is a tale told by an idiot. It, life, this uh, play, this shadow puppet uh, theater that is life. A tale told by an idiot, uh, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. What does life really mean? It's a tale told by an idiot. It could be a commentary on, on God. I'm not sure, on the playwright, whoever wrote this play that we're acting out, as, that is our life, uh, making a lot of sound, running around the stage a lot, and what does it all mean? To Macbeth, it means nothing. So, you see, it takes time. It takes time to glean meaning uh, from a piece of Shakespeare, but I hope you'll find that it's worth it, and I hope that you'll enjoy uh, the play that we'll be reading. And uh, like I said, keep practicing, be forgiving of yourself, do it a little bit of the time, uh, read the glosses in moderation at the bottom of the page, and I, I hope you'll find that it's a rewarding experience for you. Okay, that's it. I'll see you guys online.